Thank you for joining me for another human nutrition video. We're going to talk about micronutrient function in energy metabolism today. And in order to do that, we have to talk about vitamins. So vitamins are organic compounds. They don't give us any caloric value. However, they're very needed for normal functioning of the human body. But they're micronutrients, so we don't need them in very large quantities, but we have to have enough for maintenance of the body and growth to occur. Uh, and the absence of these vitamins from our diet obviously can cause all kinds of different issues, which we're going to talk about today. So because they're a micronutrient and we only need small amounts to prevent these deficiencies, um, humans only need to consume about one ounce of vitamins for every 120, or 150 pounds of food that they consume. Um, now, plants can synthesize all the vitamins they need, which is kind of nice. And by the way, that's where we get most of our vitamins from, is eating those plants. Humans, they can't produce their own vitamins. Um, and I thought this was kind of funny. Humans and guinea pigs don't make vitamin C. It's kind of a no-brainer. But there are some animals that can produce some vitamins. Now, I should say that um, humans don't produce their own vitamins, but kind of, sort of, with vitamin K, uh, we get vitamin K from a symbiotic relationship that we have with E. coli in the gut. So we feed E. coli, the E. coli gives us vitamin K to prevent blood clotting, uh, or actually to help, excuse me, blood clotting. Factors affecting vitamin content uh, is very important when you look at the ripeness of your fruits and vegetables. The more ripe they are, the more vitamins they're going to have, which for us in the United States, this is kind of an issue because a lot of our food is transported from a, a long ways off, sometimes a couple thousand miles. And in order to be able to transport that food, we have to pick that food when it is not ripe. It's still kind of green and raw. And so a lot of the foods that we eat don't have enough vitamins in them. And so the question always is, should we be taking vitamins on a daily basis? And the answer to that is no. You shouldn't have to take vitamins every day if, and it's a big if, you are consuming the right fruits and vegetables, obviously also with the right ripeness, that you're getting all of those vitamins from the food that you eat. But the majority of Americans, this isn't happening for, and so you want to make sure that you are taking your vitamins and maybe even minerals on a daily basis. And you also have to remember one thing, you get what you pay for when it comes to vitamins. So another important thing is uh, storing the fruits and vegetables because vitamins degrade the longer you store them. And that would include like vitamin C and some of your B vitamins like folate and thymine, which we're going to talk about. Excessive cooking. So used to be you boiled your vegetables and what they used to say is you could throw the vegetables away just make sure you drink the water that you boiled them in because you're boiling out a lot of those vitamins and the cooking can destroy those vitamins if it's heated too much and then reheated too often and then depending on where you store your food uh, the hotter it is, the greater the possibility that enzymes can degrade the vitamins in the food. And then oxidation due to air exposure, um, especially when vegetables have already been peeled, can destroy your vitamins. And then alkalinity destroys vitamin D, thymine, and some other vitamins. So how to preserve vitamins in your food. You want to make sure that you're keeping your fruits and vegetables cool. And uh, most likely that is by refrigerating them. But bananas, onions, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, you don't really want to have to refrigerate those. You're going to put those in some airtight container or in some kind of vegetable drawer to keep them. And then trim and cut parts off of your uh, vegetables, but only what is inedible. You should be leaving everything else. And probably the best way to cook your vitamins is to steam fry them or to stir fry them. 
And then you could also steam them like in a microwave, but probably microwave not exactly the best. It can still destroy some of the uh, vitamin value in your veggies. And you don't want to have to cook a lot, so you minimize your cooking time. Store canned goods in a cool, dry place and store frozen foods at zero degrees or colder uh, for 12 months maximum. And then keep milk away from light because that uh, being exposed to too much light, which is why um, a lot of the milk cartons are thicker so that there's not light that's going to come through that, it helps to preserve the B vitamin called riboflavin. And this just shows you, you can look at this later, some of the um, things that happen with your water-soluble versus your fat-soluble vitamins. And today we're basically going to be talking mostly about your water-soluble B vitamins and what's going on with them in the body. Those B vitamins would include B1, which is thymine, B2, riboflavin, B3, niacin, B5, pantothenic acid, vitamin B6, pyridoxine, B7, biotin, B9, folic acid, or sometimes also pronounced folate, vitamin B12, cyanocobalamin. So the water-soluble vitamins, you have to ingest them regularly, but any excess that you're going to take, because it's water-soluble, it's going to dissolve in the water of the body and then be removed from the body. So either by the kidneys, you're going to have it end up in the urine or in the stool. And most are not stored, except for B12 can be stored. Uh, easily lost when food is cooked in the water. We talked about that, so just drink that water if you're going to boil your vegetables. Or probably stir-fry, steam them would be the best way to go. So they often co-occur in the same foods, and so that's good. When you're eating particular foods, you're going to get more than one type of B vitamin. And they're all involved in cellular respiration. So B vitamins are very important in helping us to produce ATP. And what they do is they act as a coenzyme. They're helping enzymes move faster, do their job better, catalyze reactions so that ATP production can keep going at a fast clip. So I don't know if you've ever heard people say, oh yeah, you know, if you're tired, you need to make sure you take your B vitamins and those B vitamins will help you to feel more energetic. And the fact is they're absolutely correct. The v B vitamins are important in helping to keep the rate of cellular respiration up. Now, in the United States, because remember, we're getting our vitamins from the plants we eat. There were some processes that we started doing to these plants that started stripping them of their B vitamins, and we'll talk about what happened later, but diseases started showing up. So in the United States, many of our grains were refined, and what was happening is we were producing things like white flour or white rice. And so in order to do that, you've got to take out the nutrient-rich parts of the uh, wheat or the rice. And so you're taking out like the wheat germ, the bran, the husk. That's all discarded. And that is where we're going to see most of our B vitamins and other minerals, as a matter of fact. So then what happened is because of all these diseases, the United States said, okay, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to enrich the food with these vitamins. So we are taking them out in these processes. We're going to have to put them back in. So we started enriching food with like thymine and riboflavin, niacin, folic acid in the United States. And we also talked about this before, but like vitamin D and to some extent some calcium in order to reduce... Um, the incidence of these disease deficiencies. Now, refined grains are still lower in all kinds of nutrients, and so it's not preferred for you to eat these refined grains. So if you're looking here, for instance, vitamin B6, okay, and the nutrient content, percent of each nutrient contributed by whole grain products, okay, versus when we go from brown rice, white rice, 
whole wheat bread, white bread. So if you're looking here with vitamin B6 and you're looking at white rice, this is the nutrient content versus looking at brown rice. And then you look at white bread and how much B6 is in white bread versus whole wheat bread. Same thing, potassium in white rice, potassium in brown rice. Potassium in whole, white bread, potassium in whole wheat bread, and zinc, a little bit better with zinc with white rice, but still way more zinc with brown. And then white bread versus whole wheat, magnesium, you can see a huge difference here. Um, this is why a lot of people talk about B vitamin deficiencies, magnesium deficiencies, and then look at fiber. Uh, white rice, mm, pretty much no fiber compared to brown, and then white bread compared to whole wheat bread. So you can see these refined foods are not giving us as much nutrient value as foods that are whole grain. So thymine is vitamin B1, and this was the first vitamin discovered. Uh, it is um, the dietary form of thymine uh, are converted to a coenzyme called thymine pyrophosphate that's used in our body during glycolysis. And so this helps us to convert glucose into pyruvic acid in order to produce ATP. Thymine is absorbed in the small intestine primarily by passive diffusion in the jejunum. And deficiencies in thymine were a big deal, and in some countries still a big deal, especially where um, refined processes were occurring and people were getting this disease which was referred to as beriberi or I can't, I can't. And the reason that they called it that is because weakness was a huge problem. And so you think about, I can't get up, I can't move, I can't eat, I can't do anything. And they had nerve degeneration and nerve irritability, which means that like the nerves were jumpy and uh, created peripheral neuropathy, which is pain in the nerves and loss of coordination edema, enlarged heart, leading to heart failure, and these symptoms were due to poor metabolism of glucose. So if you can't take your carbohydrates and you can't convert them into pyruvic acid, that can't move into the citric acid cycle or the electron transport chain, and we're going to have a decrease in ATP production leading to this beriberi. So depression and weakness can be seen after only 10 days of a thymine-free diet. So this is just a, a illustration of the fact that the person has loss of reflexes, muscles are painful and tender, uh, you can see emaciation, and uh, they had difficulty swallowing, they weren't able to really stand up, they had pitted edema, enlarged heart, and then all kinds of um, problems neurologically, coma, even death. So found in areas where things were more refined, more white rice than brown rice type of thing, uh, and then refining of grains. So the recommended daily allowance for thymine is about 1.1 to 1.2 milligrams per day. Men usually exceed this by 50% or more. Women typically just barely meet this in the United States. Sources would be like pork products, whole grains, wheat germ, uh, ready-to-eat breakfast cereals. We have added thymine to those and also to our refined grains. Uh, green beans, milk, orange juice, organ meats, peanuts, dried beans, and seeds. Now it's kind of interesting because there are groups of people who are just purely carnivore. And uh, that means no veggies or fruits in their diet, they're just eating meat. So now the question is, if they're just eating meat on a daily basis and we get most of our vitamins from plants, can they get the vitamins and minerals they need 
from eating this meat? And most of them say yes, as long as they eat organ meat. So organ meat has a tendency to have more vitamins and minerals in it uh, than just the regular meat. This is showing you some of the foods that we can get thymine in. So for instance, Cheerios, uh, 31 to 34%, peas, about 38%, squash, 31 orange juice, 18%, ham uh, is about 74%, so your pork products. Too bad, watermelon's only 5%. Riboflavin is vitamin B2. It is also an enzyme that helps in the metabolic processes to make ATP, and it helps in fatty acids being broken down as an energy source. So riboflavin participates in energy-yielding pathways, that fatty acid metabolism, or what we would refer to as beta-oxidation. So riboflavin is breaking down those carbon chains cutting the chains two carbons at a time, helping the lipase enzyme in order to create that two carbon molecule, which then becomes acetyl coenzyme A. And that helps to start the citric acid cycle. And riboflavin also assists some vitamins and other minerals in metabolism, so it's acting with those vitamins in order to produce ATP. And it is also an antioxidant and it supports the enzyme we've talked about, glutathione peroxidase. So riboflavin, if we have a deficiency in riboflavin, we have a riboflavinosis, and this is inflammation of the mouth and tongue, and cracking in the corners of the mouth, the chelosis, and also cracking uh, typically on the sides and the tip of the tongue. And these are very painful cracks, and you can tell by looking at them, it doesn't look like a lot of fun. Uh, dermatitis and other eye disorders can occur, sensitivity to the sun, some uh, confusion, and it occurs jointly with, excuse me, niacin, thymine, and vitamin B6 deficiencies. So this is just showing you some other of uh, that chelosis occurring, inflammation there, here again. Arabdoflavinosis, so sore red eyes and lids, uh, that angular stomatitis, which is that chelosis, glossitis or swelling of the tongue, and then uh, scrotal dermatitis is another big one for uh, men. Getting enough riboflavin, the recommended daily allowance is 1.1 to 1.3 milligrams per day. Uh, the average intake is slightly above the RDA. And so riboflavin supplementation isn't necessarily something that a lot of people need. And so what you might see is you might see kind of a yellowish fluorescent type of urine because all that excess riboflavin is being eliminated from the body. And uh, flavus in riboflavin means yellow. So alcoholics are at increased deficiency of pretty much any type of vitamin. Um, but because of a diet low in riboflavin dense foods, they're at an increased risk for riboflavin deficiencies. And the foods we can get riboflavin would be like milk products, uh, enriched grains, ready-to-eat cereal, liver, oysters, brewer's yeast, vegetables, uh, especially the green ones, asparagus and broccoli. But it is very sensitive to ultraviolet light and it, stored, it needs to be stored in some kind of container that does not allow light through, which is also why a lot of your vitamin bottles are going to be brown so that light doesn't penetrate as well. And here's just some other food sources of riboflavin, like Kellogg's cereal, because it's enriched with riboflavin. Liver, look at that, 255%. It's too bad I don't care for liver. 
Niacin, vitamin B3, it functions as nicotinic acid. You remember NAD, nicotinamide, dinucleotide, and it is a hydrogen carrier and it carries those hydrogens to the electron transport chain. So for every two hydrogens that NAD carries to the electron transport chain, we're able to produce three ATP molecules. So this is very important. And it is also involved in over 200 different types of cellular reactions and very important in generating that ATP from carbohydrates and fats. And as I said, NAD and even NADP, nicotinamide dinucleotide phosphate. And uh, in fatty acid synthesis, it, we require niacin uh, as a coenzyme in producing NAD. And having niacin deficiency gives you what is called pellagra. And pellagra gives you this rough or scaly skin. And uh, we don't really see this as much in the United States anymore, although between the 1800s to the 1930s, before we had that Enrichment Act, uh, this was a deficiency that was an epidemic in the U.S. And the symptoms of pellagra are considered the three Ds dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia, which of course can then lead to death. And this still, where you're going to see this, again, where you see a lot of vitamin deficiencies, are in people who are severe alcoholics. So this is that peeling and the redness, hardening of the skin, especially it hardens after sun exposure. Just some other pictures of pellagra. Um, this is prevented with an adequate protein diet that is enriched and uh, it became an epidemic in southern Europe in the early 1700s when they switched to corn as a staple and it reached epidemic proportions in southeastern United States also and again this is because we were refining things and because we do eat a lot of corn. So corn treated in an alkaline solution releases the protein-bound niacin, making it available in corn products such as tortillas, tacos, tortilla chips, corn flour. The adult recommended daily allowance for niacin is 14 to 16 grams per day. The average American, because we enrich everything with niacin because we don't want this pellagra, uh, we take in probably double what we need. Uh, chicken is a very good source of niacin. The tryptophan in chicken can also be metabolized to niacin in the body. Niacin is heat stable and, like I said, it can be synthesized from tryptophan. And food sources, chicken, fish, tuna, beef, peanuts, ready-to-eat cereals, asparagus, coffee and tea, those are good sources of niacin. And then here's some others, raisin bran. Look at how much we fortify or enrich with niacin. Uh, yellowfin tuna, that's a lot of niacin. Chicken breasts, uh, even peanut butter. Raw mushrooms, lots of niacin. So avoiding too much niacin is also very important. The upper limit is 35 milligrams per day for nicotinic acid and uh, that is one of the forms of niacin. However, large doses sometimes are prescribed by doctors and are used to lower blood uh, LDL cholesterol levels, but it can have very uh, adverse side effects, for instance, damage to the gastrointestinal tract and liver, and then you can also have what's called a niacin flush if you're taking more than 100 milligrams per day, and that also can lead to headaches, itching, and then the flushing is where you have increased blood flow to the skin. Let me go through this really quick. And you can see here what happens is the person gets really red. And when you do this, you actually do feel very hot. So it's not just that the skin turns red, but you actually feel the heat of the blood rushing to the skin. 
So uh, too much niacin, the only issue is with the nicotinic acid form, which is what's typically found in vitamins. And like I said, again, that causes that niacin flush and then the GI liver problems. Recommended daily allowance for niacin is about 14 milligrams per day for women and 16 milligrams per day uh, for men, but the mega doses again are supposed to help with cholesterol uh, LDL levels and to lower those and increase HDL levels as well as uh, lowering triglyceride levels. The next B vitamin is vitamin B5, which is pantothenic acid. And this also, again, works as a coenzyme that is essential for carbohydrate, fat, and protein uh, breakdown in order to produce ATP. And if you have a B5 deficiency, it's usually going to be in combination with other vitamin deficiencies. So in Greek, pantothenic acid means on every side, and that is because it's found in a lot of different foods, and deficiencies are very rare, of course, alcoholics again, because think about it, they're not um, really eating very much. You have a liquid breakfast, liquid lunch, liquid dinner that doesn't have a lot of greens included in it. There's no upper limit that's known, uh, so you don't usually get toxicity with pantothenic acid, but you're going to find pantothenic acid in things like sunflower seeds, mushrooms, peanuts, eggs, milk and milk products, meats and veggies. And the adequate intake would be about 5 milligrams per day for adults. Now, if there is a pantothenic acid or B5 deficiency, uh, and we find this in the alcoholics, the result is usually a slow metabolism, and usually um, the person is um, going to have a lot of tingling sensations in the nerves, uh, along with some acne, which is kind of interesting, could also be involved in allergies. So people have higher allergy responses if they don't have enough B5. And B5 is needed for production of adrenal hormones such as cortisol. And cortisol prevents histamine release, which causes uh, uh, allergies and allergic symptoms. So that's kind of an interesting correlation with vitamin B5. No upper limit is set, like we said, no toxicity. Whole grain cereal, 200% of the dosage of B5 that you need in a day. Power bars, 216%, liver, 112%, uh, sunflower seeds, dry roasted, 52%. So again, show you some of the food sources that are good for pantothenic acid. Um, peroxidine or vitamin B6 functions as a coenzyme, again, for carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and 100 plus amino acids and protein reactions. So keep in mind these B vitamins, they're helping us with ATP production, but they're also acting as coenzymes for a ton of other metabolic processes as well. So for instance, synthesis of certain neurotransmitters, uh, conversion of tryptophan into niacin it requires B6. Uh, it aids in homocysteine metabolism, which we're going to talk about homocysteine and how it interacts with the cardiovascular system. And then breakdown in glycogen into glucose. So uh, do you remember the word for glycogen breakdown into glucose? That would be glycogenolysis and then synthesis of hemoglobin, synthesis of white blood cells. So you really don't want to have a deficiency of vitamin B6 because this is going to create widespread depression, vomiting, skin disorders, nerve problems, impaired immune systems. And then if it helps in making hemoglobin, uh, what's going to happen is your vitamin B6 deficiency is going to produce very small red blood cells with lower than normal concentrations of hemoglobin. And those are called microcytic hypochromic red blood cells or microcytic hypochromic anemia. Microcytic means smaller than normal size. Hypochromic means they're not as dark 
pink red color because hemoglobin is what gives those red blood cells their color. So if I don't have as much hemoglobin, I'm not going to have as much color. And then cells can't produce ATP. So getting enough vitamin B6, the uh, recommended uh, adult dose for vitamin uh, B6 is 1.3 to 1.7 milligrams per day. And athletes may need more uh, due to increased processing of proteins and fats and glycogen and making ATP. So vitamin B6 we can get from animal products, those fortified cereals, potatoes, spinach, bananas, cantaloupes. Uh, B6 in animal foods and fortified foods is better absorbed than B6 from plants for humans. So this shows you your special K, 154%, liver, turkey breast, 62, 54%, baked potatoes with the skin, that's always important, a banana, 31%, Good sources of B6. You want to avoid too much B6. Now notice this bottle, 500 milligrams as a supplement. So the upper limit is 100 milligrams per day. So you want to watch to see how much you're getting in the vitamins that you're purchasing. Some tablets can have up to 500 milligrams. So two to six grams per day for two months uh, can cause irreversible nerve damage, and this is not good. So it leads to difficulty walking, numbness in the hands and feet from this B6 toxicity.